Oh, excellent. So we're now we're now live to the London Coffee Festival. Um, hi, I'm Tom Booth from Malgrano, and uh, I'm here with a panel of exciting people to talk to you about, uh, well, we're talking about direct relationships, and Stuart has uh, put together a market report. Um, so I think if everyone can go around and just say hi, um, who you are and what you've been doing. Let's start off with Stuart, as uh, yeah, it was your report that started the whole panel talk. Yeah, my name is Stuart. Um, I have a private consult coffee consulting business called S Ritz and Consulting, my name. And uh, yeah, I partnered with El Grano to do some research into how uh, how the last year had been for coffee roasters all across Europe, how that might affect their buying, um, and a few other sort of you know exploring this area with the idea that we'd share that information or El Grano would share that information with uh, coffee growers so that they could help understand the roasting market better and what their clients were going through. So yeah, I'm a coffee consultant working in coffee for the last 10 years and I'm based in the Netherlands. Nice. And let's go to, I just go in order of what's on my screen. So let's go with Sam. Hi, my name is Sam. Um, I'm the head roaster of uh, Old Spike Roaster in uh, in London. And I said that'd be short, but that's, yeah, it's me. No, yeah, spot on. And uh, <laughs> then to another roaster, we've got Nathan here. Uh, hi, I'm Nathan Retzer. Uh, I'm the roaster and owner of Quarter Horse Coffee in Birmingham. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all I do. <laughs> and let's fly out across the world to Peru. And we've got uh, Marjorie. And you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Hi. Now you can hear me? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm Marjorie Bonilla. I'm the commercial manager of Copcomar. We are a, a producer and exporter cooperative in Peru. Perfect. And then Neil. Hi there. I'm Neil Vohora. Uh, I run Edelweiss Uldiani Estates and Finagra Plantations here in Tanzania. Uh, we've been in coffee for the last 90 years and I'm the third generation. Wow, fantastic. So, you, yeah, we've got a whole room of uh, pretty exciting people. Uh, I'm Tom, yeah, I'm from Algrano, and Algrano is an online platform where we help connect roasters and growers um, so that roasters can buy coffee from, uh, yeah, from different growers around the world. So we went into partnership with Stuart, who uh, is here today to run a purchasing uh, report and we were looking at the trends especially with the growth of e-commerce and uh, to see what people are looking for uh, so it would could feed back to growers and see how we could work on the two-way communication so I think starting off with the general kind of overview of the benefits from talking to growers like for you guys Nathan and Sam do you find what's the value for you of uh, being able to connect with a, a grower directly, and how do you do it? Let's go with Nathan. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I mean, obviously there's there's different ways as far as you are actually going out and meeting farmers, uh, which we've done before, but with El Grano, it's a nice way to, to connect um, without going anywhere, which in this time makes a lot of sense. Um, and to get lots of different and small lot things, you know, um, when you're buying spot coffee, Things can often go very quickly, often to people who I'm not a very big roaster, I'd be kind of small, medium. So, uh, you know, really stuck in the middle. But uh, this offers a chance to maybe get my hands on a couple bags that maybe only five or six were produced. Um, but then also to link up with bigger lots, too. So we've actually with, with both of the farmers here, we've got both of your coffees. Uh, so we've got the coffee from Peru right now in our house espresso blend. And we've got one from uh, your farm in Tanzania coming what a couple months. Um, so one being a small lot and then one being a very big lot. Um, so really it just helps with buying in general. Uh, and then I guess oh, for, from Neil and Marjorie, what from your point of view would be the benefits of, um, of talk, being able to talk to roasters directly? And also, do, do you see that the Algrano model is, uh, as being direct or do you see there's other things in between as well? And Marjorie uh, looks like, oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, uh, well, entering uh, the benefits of direct trade from the producer's perspective, 
I could say that you know that we are part of a fair coffee value chain and take the responsibility to be the origin of the coffee chain and offer a fair price for all the growers who work together to uh, get better opportunities to the families, to the community, caring the environment, and thinking always on the next generations. Uh, the trade for us means that we could talk about transparency uh, of all the costs and uh, get more opportunities for the coffee producer families and have the possibility to invest this fair price in different infrastructure as tap tents, soil dryers, and continue the quality from the corn to the cup of coffee. And, um, uh, yes, I believe El Grano is, uh, is a way of direct uh, benefit, you know, uh, direct sourcing. Oh, amazing for you, it's about seeing the quality right the way through from the farm through to through to the roastery and then through to the final customer. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, so, and Sam, um, how about you? Have you, uh, yeah, how do you find the value of buying coffee directly from producers? You know, we do, we do both, right? We work with importers as well. We do direct and obviously, you know, the pros are very clear like, about building a relation, an actual relation with the, with the farm to be able to, to have feedback back to back and try to, to improve what you got is something that you cannot do through an importer. So um, we, we really value that to be able to actually communicate directly with the farm, the, the communication part, especially. Yeah, I think that's, that's phenomenal. And then as we're here, as, um, as Neil, what, what do you think? Have you found, you've had some good conversations with roasters since you've been working the last two years with El Grano? Um, yeah, I think for my case, it's slightly different uh, because we're on the ground um, and affecting changes in our coffee with a very quick turnaround. So it's really helpful for us here to talk often as to what the roasters want because with our type of setup we can bespoke something for you uh, while we're working in the field and get the product that you really want there and the only way we can do that is by understanding what the roaster wants. Um, we had some good uh, discussions over messenger etc with some of the roasters um, in particular some of our experimental lots we found they were struggling to roast them. Uh, so we sent over our roast profiles and it unlocked a whole load of potential for them, which drove some sales, which was perfect. So that's that's the benefit of good communication. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's phenomenal. And I think roasters would really relate to it because as a roaster, you're very much used to explaining to your customers, this is the best way to brew the coffee and this is my recipe for espresso. And... So it makes sense to keep going back up the chain and go to you guys and say, what's the best way to roast the coffee? Um, how about Stuart? Have you seen uh, a change um, in the in the market over the last few years and, and doing the report? Yeah, I think I was really surprised to see how many um, roasters in the, in the survey we did had had direct connection with farmers. Um, I think there was definitely a time a few years ago when that was pretty rare. Like there were successful um, roasters who had a bit of money in their margin to travel and to travel to, to producing countries. And there were a lot of people who, who couldn't do that. I think that's the reality. That's not maybe the way that the market might perceive it, but I think that was kind of true. And I work with quite a few different roasters who may have visited an origin country once. It's a it's an experience they've had and an important experience, but not something they could do regularly. So I was a bit surprised to see how many people had had like a direct connection. Um, I do think that is happening more and more. And uh just in the same way, when I started working in coffee, there was very little information about coffee in general. And now there's lots of great books and lots of great online resources 
people are a lot more cute clued up about how things work about um, how for instance certain drying methods versus other ones may impact the longevity of the green and things like that and that that is also driving roasters to want to be more engaged with with uh, producers so i have definitely seen um, more of an interest in in building those connections and and in a, and and asking more and more particular questions whether it's for an importer or to the to the farmer directly like really particular questions um, which is interesting, um, so, but that's definitely happening. Uh, yeah, I think that's, um, but that's part of the whole bit, isn't it? Is what, what questions would you want to know and you don't know until you start getting asked? And like going to Neil and saying, what's the best way of roasting this coffee? Because it's a very different experimental profile. Um, I guess, I mean, Marjorie, do you, know, you used to have a lot of people coming out and, and visiting uh, Umarp? Uh, well, yes, uh, during, but not the last year for the pandemic situation. Uh, uh, years before, uh, the company has 15 years using and exporting coffee. Uh, we have the opportunity to be visited from a lot of importers uh, from different parts of the world, from United States, from Europe. So uh, it wasn't always for us uh, the the moment we really meet the importers, the rosters, because we believe that they could give them a great and real coffee experience growing. And that would make them understand better all the work that producers, the producers do and made to have a great coffee to offer them. So yes, uh, we are always uh, happy to, to be visited from the rosters here. But I guess recently you've not really had visits from anybody. So how do you work? How do you keep in touch with people that maybe you're used to seeing every year? Well, uh, by mail, uh, by video calls, uh, it was impossible to get visited. So uh, we always uh, speak with them uh, by mail and or other social media platforms. Uh, especially uh, because they are more interactive in communication with the uh, social media. But uh, <clears throat> our relationships with the rosters or with the clients are from over more than five years. So we believe that they are going to visit us this year or maybe the next year. Yeah, it's just putting it off for now until uh, we get through the pandemic. And then... Um... And and same for Neil. I mean, I think you've got a large part of the like the wildlife sanctuary there that people come and visit as well as the farm. Um, so I guess you have even more visitors. Um, yeah, we do get quite a few visitors, um, and they like to to combine a trip to the farms to one of the national parks around us. I mean, most of the time, they don't even need to leave the the farm to find the animals. They're right up close to you in the in the coffee. <laughs> Um, uh, it has been a challenge uh, with, the, with the pandemic. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, origin trips arranged and cupping competitions, which all had to go by the wayside, which we find are really good um, means for raising our profile. Um, the coffee producer space is very congested, so to try and get noticed is really difficult. So. Those origin trips are really important um, because everyone is proud of their farms here and wants to showcase it. But for the roaster coming out, the sights, the smells, the sounds, it makes it a special trip. It's very memorable, uh, particularly in our case with wildlife running around. Uh, yeah, I think it's got to be super memorable when you've got an, uh, elephants walking past uh, coffee plants, right? Uh, that must be phenomenal. Um, well, I mean, to, to you guys, to Sam and Nathan, have you been uh, talking to um, to different growers over the last twelve months, and and how do you do it, or is it something that you don't do that often? Oh, you both look the same. Sam, there we go. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a bit of a boring answer, but uh, you know, through email, basically. It's a good way to, to do it for us because sometimes your day to day, you know, as a roaster, um, you know, be able to check like when you can not being 
you know, not having like a cold or anything like that usually help us a lot. But um, mm -hmm. but we, we tend to communicate, definitely. And I value, for example, having this kind of video Zooms, the email, and also the email is also important because we have a good tracking of what we talked before, you know, the the famous chains that we all, we have to go through all the time to be able to be part of the conversation. Um, but obviously it's not comparable to going to origin, right? I email is not a real, 100% real conversation. It's not like a face-to-face -face and you're not actually experiencing anything. To be honest, our email is kind of boring, right? Um, <laughs> yes. but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. But, but it is what, it's the tool we got right now. So, um, so yeah, basically that's the way we, we are doing it. Uh, also, um, I don't sorry if I can chime in too. Uh, WhatsApp also helps a lot because yeah, obviously with yeah. everyone in different time zones, you know, they send us updates on the coffee that's coming whenever it's convenient for them and I'll see it whenever. Um, and yeah, email is really boring, but with WhatsApp, at least you can have that record of the chain. Also normally with some photos as well, which is nice, you know, here's your coffee yeah, being yeah. processed. Yeah, here's your coffee being bagged. You know, another couple of months, it's almost ready type of thing is, is nice. Yeah, I think that's probably the a nice piece for communication is not just a lot of people say, oh, what's the communication between roasters and growers? Is it negotiating on pricing what's available in quantity? But there's a lot more um, in terms of questions you might ask or in, just in terms of how you're doing. So I mean, in terms of general cup quality and, uh, and feedback, I think we had in Stuart's survey where 95% of the roasters said that uh, the the cup quality or, or the taste profile of the coffee was the most important thing to them. Um, so for, for you all, I, do you think that uh, communication would help with, with finding the right cup quality? Because I don't, personally, I don't necessarily think that cup quality in terms of a score is the most important thing to people. I think it's um, a taste profile and a, and a cup quality that you're looking for. So you might be looking for something very different, like Nathan and Sam might be looking for very different coffees and you might have the same coffee put in front of you. And for one of you, it'd be perfect and exactly what you need. And for the other one, not so much. Um, so how do you go about, yeah, kind of narrowing down the coffees that you look for? That's a very broad question. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, go on, Stuart. Stuart's got someone to do what's the job. Yeah, in. so, well, I have a, it's part of my consulting. I also source for, for some roasters and things. And um, and it's it's a really hard question. That that work, that, that piece of consulting I do ongoing is looking for really exceptional micro lots and price isn't such an issue, which is a really fun thing to do as a piece yeah. of work. But it's, um, it's really hard, like, um, because a lot of the coffee, I, a cup of taste is outstanding, but it, sometimes it's not just what we're looking for. And actually communicating that, like what you're looking for is really hard. You know, it's in the same way that actually basically every customer in the world has the sensory capability to taste coffee, but they just don't have the training. And even as a trained coffee professional, it's sometimes hard to get across um, what's missing, you know, in a coffee in a way that's meaningful. But I'm really interested actually to hear everyone else's responses about this because sometimes I think it's it can be not super helpful to say, yeah, I want more body or I want more this or that because maybe a roaster, I'm in the Netherlands, but maybe Nathan or Sam in different parts of the UK might experience with their water, their setup, very different coffee. So yeah, I, did, I am quite interested to hear people's point of view, but I would say it's really hard to give um, meaningful feedback. Giving feedback is easy, giving meaningful feedback is hard. Yeah, I think I can, I can kind of say too, piggybacking on that, it's also not even whether the coffee's a good quality, it's just whether it's the right time or fits, you know? I've had so many coffees where I go, that's a great coffee, I already have two that taste like that, and I just can't take it you know, and, and, that, and that feels a bit mean. But then there's also, you know, I think like what Stuart was saying, it is hard to communicate. Um, you know, we ended up picking coffee from Neil, but we cupped other ones from Tanzania too. And I preferred his, but even now, even with notes I've taken, I can't tell you why I preferred his. The other ones were, were good, just as good, but there was just, you know, I don't know, on that cupping table, that's what I preferred. That's what I ended up buying. I don't know how that, to feed that back to 
importance for farmers that actually is really helpful. <laughs> I'm not really sure how helpful that is. I guess yeah, the... I, I agree with you actually. Like, uh, I, it's sometimes difficult for me to remember that the coffee I'm having is not for me. It's not, I'm not the one who's going to be paying for it and drinking it and, and all that. So it's something that I really, really need to take my, my head up, my head up, um, around it. So when I'm capping, I'm always thinking about who is, who's that coffin is going for? What sort of, um, what part of my cost, the, the customer base is going to drink that coffee? Some people, as you know, you know, they're looking for a comforting, sweet experience in coffee. And another one's looking for more rock and roll, right? So you kind of have to, to think about that, especially where that coffee can fit in your, in your offering. And what, what, where the offering is going for your customer base. Yeah, so you're almost not even not even picking the coffees that you personally think this is what I like the best. It's more this is what my customers are looking for because they've come you. Funny enough, this uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting no. you with the with the Zoom. I'm always I'm always interrupting that by accident. <laughs> but um, even this year, we start at All Spike. Um, we want to be crazy, and we are doing a new range that we call it the Select range so with that one yeah with that one we are going for the more special high score kind of like experience for the customer um not thinking much about the margins but just thinking about giving them best experience that we think for the you know for the coffee and um, the thing that actually we think it has the better quality but overall that's not the biggest part of our business it's just uh, yeah what that coffee is going for is what we actually thinking when we're capping and i mean well for, for marjorie and for neil but i think neil used to we're talking about you have a lot of different uh, experimental micro lots um i know you, you do have quite a lot of different micro lots as well how do you guys decide like which lots and which kind of profiles you'll focus on for the next harvest is that through talking to roasters or is it through more of this is what you enjoy doing. Um, on our side, we have our in-house quality control. So we've got a Q grader who's my sister. And so by developing ideas, I do a lot of research, etc., on the farm. So we, we start with the idea um, ourselves and then we'll trial it at the start of the season and then see what, what starts coming out. And if we like the coffee, we'll start talking to our roasters and say, hey, we're, we're trying this crazy thing here. Uh, are you guys interested in getting on board with it? Um, because the, we made mistakes in the past where we'd go sort of like throw ourselves into an experiment and either there'd be no market for it or um, it'd be a failure. So by doing it in small steps and then scaling it up when we get, we've, we've discussed with our clients, then we can then utilize that to, to, to get get to where we want to be but also continuously cup tasting on our side and having the expertise there is really important so we know what what's coming out of the field at the time and then after we've sold the coffee getting the good feedback here helps us because I send that back to the farm to all the personnel there to review it so for the coming season we also know where we need to tweak here where we need to invest etc so it's so feedback's really important to you um yeah. i think we've had this on calls before we've been told um yeah but by various producers and last one was uh, with some guys in mexico and it was very much we just like saying no to the coffee is okay but saying nothing is not okay and we need to have like if you're having if you get samples and you have the coffee then we need some sort of feedback. And I guess even if it's a no, like a no's can still be really helpful because then you can see why people aren't focusing on this coffee and why they might like something else more. Um, do you find that, uh, Marjorie, with in terms of how you, how you process coffees and even how you price coffees, um, would you change things based on feedback or, or is it very warm uh... way? Uh, no, uh, well, we really consider uh, the commitment of the quality as a fundamental criteria for a uh, long relationships of the coffee value. And for that, we are always asking about the roster's feedback coffees. And um, 
we believe that the communication should flow from both sides, from the producers, roasters, and from the roasters to the producers. And always we're asking, when we find a good coffee, because we have also a quality uh, <clears throat> grader here too. Uh, when we find a coffee, we're always uh, uh, looking to uniformize the quality with our clients, know their profile, know what they like it, know uh, what they think about the coffee. For example, when we send the samples, we send a lot of samples to Algrano. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are sure that this is a great strategy for us to get to know if we are really making a good job and if they are really market for the coffee we are producing. Yeah, I mean, you've had some some stunning lots. I think, uh, yeah, Carl has had some great naturals. You've got a, a really nice uh, kind of wash blend. Um, uh, well, we're trying for the last three years to uh, make some microlots. Uh, that microlots weren't in the Algrano platform. Uh, we found the samples, but uh, maybe it was not the coffee they were looking for. But we're sending samples of microlots and selling microlots to other clients. So uh, for that reason, uh, this, uh, this harvest, we are thinking to, to send more microlot samples. And you could uh, cap it and give your opinion to us. Yeah, which is phenomenal to be able to yeah come back before they're even before they're even sent across. Um, so I think we'll move on a little bit and change to to transparency and traceability uh, because that's been a really hot topic recently. I mean, Stuart, um, what do you think is kind of missing at the moment, still at an industry level, in terms of transparency with pricing and traceability with coffee? Yeah, I think this question is a really interesting one. And I was thinking a lot about this. I mean, one thing that stands, there's a few things that stand out to me, so I'll, I'll say a few things. But um, one is possibly worker pay at farm level. Like, we're, it's funny because as we're getting, like, FOB was like, whoa, FOB pricing. Like, a few years ago, who has that? Only the importer, maybe a few roasters. Now that's getting a bit more normalized. And we're getting a little bit closer, like, farm gate few places now doing importers and, and and through platforms like yourselves like farmgate is kind of possible and so then the next stage maybe in a few years i don't think this is really applicable now but like you know how much are you paying the pickers how much uh, are the farm workers making and and uh, those kind of things because uh, that's that's where i see the price transparency going next like at least some understanding and what ties in with that which i think is really important and i think this is really hard you don't you can't really no individual player can do this for the market but i think it's really important to build this understanding is the cost of living in places you know so i, I was reading a really interesting article about uh, pricing kenyan coffee and an importer in this case had come in and they had um, offered twice um, they were they had built this new structure where they were able to pay the farmers directly and um, they were paying 100 Kenyan shillings for a kilo of cherry instead of 50 um, which sounds great it's twice as much but it's also like how much is that when I did the calculation earlier today that's the difference between 34 pence a kilo and 68 pence a kilo which seems astronomically tiny but then that's also out of we have no context you know i don't know how much living in rural kenya costs maybe that's a huge difference maybe that's not and actually with a lack of understanding of these things it's sometimes hard to know what real impact you're having unless you have these kind of like a, we're talking about today like a direct relationship with a farmer well they can tell you like yeah i had to sell my car because i needed the money or they can tell you, yeah, I just made some improvements on the farm because I had this, you know, that's a different way of approaching it. But but definitely, I think this contextual information is often missing. Um, yeah. And so I guess, yeah, it's looking into all the details, not just the cost of the coffee, but how much the people are getting paid that are working with the farm and not just the price of the coffee that's going back to the farm, but how much the people actually working on the farm are getting paid and then the cost of living our origin. Marjorie, how 
happy would you be kind of going through all that kind of level of detail um, in terms of if you're yeah g- going through traceability and saying this is what we pay our pickers and this is kind of the different levels of a breakdown of the price from the cooperative to the farm down to the, everybody that works there? Uh, well, as a direct uh, produce er, and exporter, we believe in the pricing policy, and we always base in a minimum price for our producers. And this price that we pay to them increase depending on the quality, uh, depends of the process they made. We pay it more from, for example, a natural coffee, because it's a process is a diff- different process from wash and it takes more work and more cost to produce it. So um, we also share all this information uh, to the exporters, sorry, to the importers and also um, to the producers. So every year we have a, a meeting with all the producers and explain uh, all the prices uh, where what the uh, importers pay the coffee and use these profits of the harvests of the year uh, to build with them a better infrastructure to them so they could uh, continue offering a better quality of coffee. So uh, we are really uh, interested in getting um, more opportunities to them and giving a giving a fair price to the families and also make some education projects to them. So it is really important for us the direct trading for because it makes us the possibility to give them to the producers a fair price and get better opportunities to them. Yeah, and I guess you see very much that the better the quality for the coffee, the the better the price you can get for the producers. Um, and would you almost encourage them, if you see a large demand for, say, a natural lot, to process more of their coffee this year uh, naturally and and expect a higher price, or do you very much leave it to them? Uh, well, yes. When we talk with the producers, um, we we tell them we have, for example, a natural contract. Uh, for for maybe 50 or 100 bats, uh, we know the producer who really can make this kind of coffee because not all the 300 producers can make it because uh, we are really um, interested in have a good quality. So we talk with the producer who have the varieties, who have the infrastructure to make this kind of coffee and tell them that if they produce this kind of coffee, I'm going to pay them a, a better price, higher price to them. Yeah. No, that's, that's pretty. And then to you guys, like Sam and Nathan, I mean, what does traceability really mean to you? Because we, we hear a lot about farm gate pricing and FOB and uh, yeah, what, what's important to you and what's what's not? Well, I think like, like Sam said before, you know, we've got to start with our customers first and what do they care about and what do they want? I think for most customers, they want, they want the story. It's, you know, they want to know who the farmer is. They want to know a name because um, it, it connects. It makes it something special. Um, I think for us, we also like to know where the coffee comes from. Um, not that regional lots are bad, but we don't like regional lots too. Um, but, you know, when you get to something a bit higher priced, a bit more specialized, we want to know. Is it a single farm? Is it some kind of processing? Is there kind of an extra bit of the story that can justify some of the price too? Um, because yeah, I think customers know the difference in quality, but the way we talk about it is it's too nerdy. It's too particular. You know, when I talk, oh, this is an 86.5 and this one's an 89, customers don't care about that. But if I say, you know, this is from this farm, this is what their family's like, this is the interesting process or interesting thing that they're doing. Oh, and the coffee's delicious that's what they want to pay for. Um, and so I think that, and, and with direct trade and, and direct relationships with farmers, we can get to know that more because every farmer does have a story. It's just sometimes we don't know that story. Yeah, I'd, uh, I think that's a really nice way of looking at it. And it's about telling the story 
um, more than getting into lots of other details. It's where's the coffee from and why has it been processed this way? I think, yeah, I mean, Neil has got some great examples of why he's doing processes. And sometimes they're just because he wants to do something crazy and experimental and it's just worked. Um, and I mean, so, I mean, Sam, uh, we've not spoken to you on this one, but let's, um, on, the, on the point of traceability, I, I've been thinking about transparency and traceability a lot. I, and I hear a lot of the time to justify the price of a coffee, we want to know, like, I mean, kind of like Stuart was saying, the, the farm gate price, but not just that, what's the, what are the people getting paid to pick coffee and what's the living conditions or how much do they need to have a general good way of life? Um, what average salary do you need in your country? But I'd like to spin it around and say as roasters, would that be of something that you would openly be happy to share with your customers as well? And say, this is what I pay the people that work in my roastery. And this is the, the cost of living in London, for instance. And this is why I'm pricing my coffee this way. Because for me, that'd be full transparency to the customer, not just the farm level, but also the roastery. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, at all spike as uh... As you probably know, Tom, we are a um, social enterprise too. So we are not only a roastery and and we do we do um, London living wage for whoever is uh, working at the roastery. But at the same time, this year, we work in, in many different things. And one of them was actually a transparency report that we want to do yearly, not only within the prices of the coffee, but even something like you, you just mentioned, like how much are the people who's working for the company that is getting paid for. And one of the missions of All Spike is to, to um, help uh, eradicate homelessness in, in London. So in, a, in, a, yeah, in our situation, it might be a bit different from other roasters, but we are really pushing to try to, to, um, yeah, to hire trainees that they can find a career in coffee from you know, from a, a desperate situation. And so that's part, part of our missions and values. And, and yeah, I'm and now working to make it as a report and kind of like share it to everybody. So I completely agree with Stuart that knowing that where our money is going in terms of how much uh, the employees and in the farms or the, the pickers and all that is uh, are getting, it's definitely something really, really important for us. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's phenomenal, especially with what you guys are doing in yeah. london and um i mean neil i know it was one of the things when we were promoting your coffee earlier on was about how much you, you pay the people that work for you um and you pay over farms that are close by to you and do you find i mean do you find that that's a help when you're talking about pricing when you're selling coffee that you say yes my coffee is slightly more expensive and it's more expensive because i'm di i'm paying the people that work for me more well, I, it's it's a difficult one talking about what um, wages are in uh, a very poor country. Um, when we're in the peak harvest, we do have upwards of 3,000 people on the farm. And these people are coming to pick coffee because their crops have failed. There's no crops in their area. They come from a long way. Um, and for the people who work, so the for the most part, we have about 800 people who are permanently employed annually. So those are more skilled uh, workers and they all have a, um, a pay grade which follows uh, a ladder system as such where even the, the minimum wage, the lowest we pay is about 15% above the minimum for uh, Tanzania. Uh, so we're a very important employer in our district because there's not a lot else going on. So um, the, the people rely on the coffee farms for, for employment, for their water, and so many of the staff have grown up through generations on the farm, and I knew them when I was a boy. Uh, some of them worked for my father, some of them worked for my grandfather. So we've all worked in a system together, and they've come up through the ranks here from starting out in the farm housing and then schooling there and then we're giving them jobs 
So we reward the guys who show the initiative and also showing a commitment to, to the farm itself. The farm is bigger than me being, being uh, the owner of it. It's made up of all of the people who grew up on the farm and continue to work for us. And we treat them like family, so healthcare. Um, we make sure that they're living, their houses are all in top order. So it's a constant battle going around here, fixing when you've got 120 houses for different employees on, on the farm, you've got running renovations going on all the time. So that little extra that comes back to the farm always goes into a worthy place here. We have to view the people and treat them because we get good work back for them if they're happy in their living conditions. And we see that immediately. And within our district, there are about 20 coffee estates and people, we get feedback that most people prefer working for us because of this long-term system that we've been undertaking about supporting um, the workers being human and making sure that it's a good place to be employed. So we're pretty proud of that, but it, it takes all of us to work together to, to achieve it. I think that's something you should definitely be proud of. I mean, that sounds phenomenal. Um, yeah, it's really good. Uh, I mean, do you want to jump in at all, Marjorie, and um, with things that are going on in Peru? Um, Oh, maybe not. Sorry, uh, I didn't hear you well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think on the on the piece on on how people are paid and and things like that is important, but also with the transparency, would you always look at how to get the most for your coffee, or the other side of it is, do you look for how to get the best price for the majority of your coffee? So like the coffee that might not be the super micro lots. Um, and what's the most important thing to you? Uh, well, as a cooperative, it's always uh, the benefit of the producer, our most important uh, criteria when we talk about the, the prices. So it's not only have a higher price, it's also uh, give a fair price to the producer. Yes, for example, we really like to sell like, our coffee very expensive or give them a more profitable price. But uh, we believe, for example, that it depends on the market. Sometimes uh, we also could love to sell a lot of micro lots, but we know that the quality of our producers is not the same. So we are focus on the market, we could sell their coffee because that's our work. No. So um, we try always to invest the, the price we could get to improvement all the coffee processes they made and, and invest in their quality of life. So uh, yeah, it, it's important uh, the price, but all, only if we could transport the profitable price to the producer only that's that's the only reason no that's that's a really yeah good point um what i'd like to do is i think we've got i mean nathan and sam you've both bought coffee from both uh huma and from neil so i wanted to know if there was any questions that either you had for um for the the growers that you've been yeah buying coffee from or also uh, marjorie and neil did you have any questions at all for nathan and sam um don't give me dead air i'll make one of you ask something oh sam you're the only person talking but you're on mute mate <laughs> there you go there you um, go yeah, it's nothing that much that come to mind in terms of questions, but um, yeah, those two coffees, I can I can really tell that they were like really good feedback for customers too. So yeah, whatever you guys do in there is working perfectly for our market here in uh, in London. Yeah, I don't think I have any question, but you know, uh, talking about the coffee from Peru, you know, I think I've got a more 
kind of community blend in at the moment. It's in our house espresso, but you know, hearing you talk about the the micro lots that are coming, it's, it it gives me a confidence that next season to look more into those and into those samples. And um, I've never bought from Neil before, so we'll see when they land. Uh, but you know, what they they cupped really nicely, and I'm really excited about them. So, um, and again, hearing that there's more other processes too, it's it, it's all it's all good because it's that constant feedback loop. And if my customers want something a bit different, knowing that I already work with producers who might do that too and could do that on a smaller level, opens it up to, you know, next season, if I, oh, can you do an anaerobic one? And you both go, oh yeah, sure. You know, then I know where I'm going to buy it from. I'm not going to go looking at somewhere else. You know, we already have a relationship. Yeah, and I think that's for me is the key to communication is that you might buy a coffee one year I want to carry on with that coffee, but it's exploring other options and what else you can get as well. Like maybe you've got a, a great wash coffee that goes for espresso, but maybe you can get an extra few bags of something for filter. Um, I think in terms of digital communication, this year has been all about the year of Zoom. Uh, if it was a Chinese Zodiac year, it would be Zoom. Um, I think there's been a lot of WhatsApp. I mean, I found WhatsApp brilliant, not just for the pictures, but it's free to call people. So um, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, I mean, Stuart, what do you think is here to stay in terms of digital, uh, in terms of stutter, my mouth, in terms of digital communication? And what do you think um, maybe we'll go back to how it used to be? Um, probably all of the, the things uh, feel new will continue. I mean, the, it was interesting to hear Sam and Nathan talk about how they communicate with um, farmers they might have bought from or worked with um, because the main responses in the survey were email and whatsapp and as someone who's done production roasting myself i know like there are moments when you, you can't like you you know the pope the queen could call and you really think twice about picking up like there <laughs> you need to be able to focus and and i think like having email really works well and and WhatsApp, it can add a layer. I have dealt, uh, worked with people who, who have kind of done with WhatsApp just because they have too many contacts and it can feel um, more pressured. Uh, but I, I use WhatsApp myself all the time. I think most people do, and that will probably carry on. Uh, and I think Zoom, while a lot of us have experienced Zoom fatigue, like uh, too many calls back and forth, I think even as uh, things open up, and travel becomes slightly more normalized. We'll see continued Zoom calls and these like virtual uh, harvest um, reports and virt virtual like harvest trips that you know you guys uh, do at El Grano and, and some other people are doing. Um, I think they'll carry on actually because um, you know regardless if if like planes are flying across the world there's certain people who physically or monetarily cannot go and would love to 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 see these things so i think actually what this last year might have done is add more layers and i don't really see those layers going away completely they may be less uh, maybe less zoom calls and less uh, of these things but i think they'll still be there in in six months a year many years ahead i think no, I think um, I think you're spot on. I think uh, now people are using things, it would be strange almost to just stop using them. Um, but I mean, as things start opening up and as borders start opening up and things like that, uh, yeah, I mean, you, both uh, Marjorie and Neil have said, you know, it's great to have people come and visit uh, and visit the farms. And and there's nothing quite like first-hand experience um, of seeing a place. Uh, I mean, what do you guys think? Nathan, uh, Sam, do you think you'll go do some origin trips maybe in 2022 and on? Yeah, I, I sure hope so. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, if anything, this added connection has actually connected me to more farmers making the list of people I want to visit even longer. So, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, I was planning to go on origin in, during this pandemic year and, and, you know, that's just on hold. So, you know, there's nothing stopping me once it restarts. I don't know about Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, obviously, I completely, completely agree. The 2020 is only be a post button in terms of uh, when are we going to, when are we actually going to go to origin? It's not that anything actually really changed. Like you said, we use Zoom more than ever. 
in fact, before 2020, 2019, I didn't know what Zoom was. And so, um, so yeah, definitely. Oh, really? yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I used to use another, I don't know, FaceTime or something else, but not specifically Zoom. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, the things have been, like I said, in pause, but they, they, you know, in 2021, hopefully we can come back with more tools than we, that we did have before. But nothing actually is going to really match of a change before, before the, yeah, the COVID-19 situation happened. No, I mean, that sort of thing is I'm hearing a lot from people. Right? And it's, yes, we still want to visit. Yes, we still want to go. But you know what? It's possibly, if anything, a little bit more comfortable to go and visit somebody if I've had three or four chats with them and I've been face-to-face. I mean, yeah. like, yeah, this is great. And if you were going to see somebody, I mean, surely it must be nicer to to have a couple of conversations on a video chat before flying out uh, across the world. And I think that probably works both ways. I mean, Marjorie and Neil, do you, do you think that you'll be coming and visiting Europe um, anytime, maybe towards the end of this year or start of next year? Um, well, uh, about visiting the Europe, uh, we have the opportunity to assist, attend to the 2019 SCA Europe Fair. Yeah. Okay. We were, yes, we visited Berlin. Yeah, for the world of coffee. Yeah. It, yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was great for us to to meet the clients, the roasteries, uh, who are who was buying our coffee and share a cup of coffee with them, talk about uh, all this <laughs> all the projects we have together for every year. So uh, I always uh, say that every people is welcome to visit us here. We always love to share our work in the uh, and share the coffee growing experience. It, it's great for us always have people around here and we really uh, believe uh, that's the only way to really um, understand uh, how work means to produce a coffee and how work means to, to share a good coffee. So, yeah, uh, and then I, I hope to visit Europe again the next year, maybe. <laughs> oh, amazing. Neil, do you travel often? Um, before uh, the pandemic, yes. <laughs> but we had a lot of the shows lined up to, we had a booth uh, ready for, um, was it Poland? And then... Yeah, and uh, then Athens. Yeah. So, and also was planning the SCAJ. So I would have liked to get to some of these shows, but obviously they're all done. This year, I'm really not sure what opportunities for coffee events are gonna be, but I mean, if Europe opens up um, over the summer, I would be interested in coming and checking out and meeting up with a load of the roasters, but really who knows? Uh, for me, the only time I'd come to Europe is in the summer months. I hate the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame you. Yeah. Well, I moved to Tanzania. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's always summer in Tanzania, right? Um, yeah, I think uh, we've, we're doing London Coffee Festival now. This is for London Coffee Festival online. But they're looking at, they've announced that we have London Coffee Festival in September as a real festival. So... At the moment, that's still going ahead in September. Uh, that would be super exciting because um, it would be one of the yeah first coffee festivals in almost two years. And so, yeah, hopefully maybe we'll have some things starting opening up this year, but I think the general feeling is definitely next year when things are back to being able to travel more freely, um, we will be going back to, to seeing each other in person because Zoom chats are great. But nothing really beats visiting the farm and also just having a coffee together um, in person. Uh, did we have, I mean, I don't know, I've no idea how many people are uh, live at London Coffee Festival we're going out to. Maybe it's three, maybe it's uh, 3,000. Um, 
I think there's a Q&A thing on here. There is a Q&A thing. Uh, oh, what's what's the next section? Is there a what's, what's next in the future of coffee? Um, what do you think? What do you guys think will be the next big thing for coffee? I mean, we've kind of, we've seen a lot of, um, yeah, different processes. We've seen a lot of talk about traceability. But what is not happening today that should be or will be happening in maybe three years, maybe five years' time? Well, that's an open question to everybody. And if anyone has listening and has any questions, what are you guys thinking for an answer to the stranger? I th you know, um, I think I was actually thinking of, about that a little bit because with um, the digital that we do now, the digital communication that we do now, yeah. it's obviously not only between, you know, between porters, roasters, farmers, but also to the, to the customer, right? Because before, you know, th those tools that were there, but 2020 really pushed us to really try to use those tools the best possible way to communicate because coffee is a, it's a, diff it's a difficult thing to communicate online. And obviously if you have a story and you wanna give a great experience using that tool, it could be a challenge in something like coffee. So I think in the next, probably ne next years, the roasteries are gonna be using that, that tool, call it social media, call it however you wanna call it in a most um, probably in very creative and interesting ways. And um, just with what we're learning. Yeah, I, I think social media, especially we've seen it uh, specifically yes. over the pandemic that it's been huge. Um, yeah. And any more for any more before we wrap this up and call it a fantastic call? I would say a trend that I've, uh, I think it's already ongoing, but really hasn't come to Europe much is the whole frozen coffee thing. Like Ooh. people are starting to get into it, but I know of one US roaster who freezes all their coffee. It's actually really interesting. They roast everything, freeze everything. And when they need it, they defrost it. So everything is like roasted. in a So they freeze it roasted? Yeah, they freeze roasted coffee. Yeah, I'm talking about roasted coffee. Though, of course, freezing freezing green is an interesting thing that I've also heard about. And I think the experimental results were sort of uh, positive, but not, not massively for the additional refrigerated costs of moving frozen coffee around the world. Um, but I mean, we'll, we'll see, maybe that will take off as well. But yeah, having roasters and even cafes as well, these really interesting cafes in Australia where they buy, you know, Panama geishas and really special microlots from people like Neil and, and then they freeze like individual portions and they have a sort of all the coffees that you could think of and they have recipes for them all. And it's really out there, it's really niche, but it's something I haven't seen in Europe and I think it's only a matter of time before someone takes that leap and tries to put it into a more commercial way like a cafe or a roaster. Yeah, that's, that would be, that would definitely be new. Um, over here at least. I think that'd be fantastic. Uh, I can just imagine, I'm just picturing like an old uh, Italian, like ice cream parlor or the, the freezer in front of you and you can kind of pick which coffee you want. They're all there frozen. Um, that yeah. is literally what this one in Australia is is like. <laughs> <So>, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, I mean, that's I love coffee because there's always things that are changing, and and also the people are really fun and welcoming, and it's nice. So I think yeah, let's uh, stay amazing. Um, keep in touch, please. And if you're out there watching this and you want to talk to Marjorie or Neil or any other coffee growers, then just sign up to Algrano. Um, it only takes your email address, create a password, and then you can see the lots, message uh, the growers um, directly, and uh, yeah, buy their amazing coffees. Uh, thank you ever so much, Sam, Nathan, Stuart, Marjorie, and Neil. Um, you guys have been amazing. Stuart, thanks for writing the report. If you want to download a copy of the report, you can do. Uh, there'll be a link for it, I'm sure, but go to algrano.com and you can find your way from there. And otherwise, if anyone's got any other questions, no, time's up. If you have any questions, then email me. <laughs> have a lovely day, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Ciao.